Got it. Okay. <laughs> Great. Um, thank you so much, uh, everybody, for coming out uh, on this uh, for this wonderful event. Um, I'm really, really honored uh, to get to be a part of this uh, and to join my colleagues and all of you in celebrating a historic anniversary. Uh, I'm thrilled to see several dedicated LGBT advocates here with us today as well as uh, some of my colleagues uh, from the United Nations. It's very fitting that we're meeting today at the Roosevelt House, uh, where Franklin and Eleanor lived for many years. As many of you know, Eleanor was the driving force behind the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and probably conceived of parts of it uh, here. Um, and most of the declaration upon which so much of our work to advance uh, peace and fundamental human rights is based, was drafted at Hunter College. So I want to thank Hunter's president, uh, Jennifer Rabb, for hosting us today in such a historically resonant place. So thank you, Jennifer. Uh, this Saturday, June 28th, we mark 45 years since the Stonewall Riots. 45 years since a collection of people in a bar a few subway stops away from where we are gathered today decided that they had had enough. 45 years ago this Saturday, they refused to line up after countless police raids. They refused to hand over their IDs or to submit to degrading pat-downs. They decided they would no longer allow someone else to tell them who they were. 45 years ago this Saturday, this small group of individuals decided to fight back against a cycle of harassment, intimidation, and bullying, sparking a national movement for the equality of LGBT persons. How far we have come from that time. Many of you know the advances that the movement has achieved since Stonewall. Many of you are in part responsible for those advances, but I'll just highlight a couple. Today, 19 states, including this one and the District of Columbia, recognize marriage equality. Today, millions of gay and lesbian people in this country can choose to serve in the military openly and proudly. How do you get from Stonewall to here? The short answer is you get there through the efforts of generations of courageous, relentless, and smart advocates who have built upon and learned from one another's efforts. And today, you will hear from three of them. Bill Ballman, whose decades-long trajectory as an advocate has in many ways traced the arc of the incremental struggle from Stonewall, beginning with his leadership on the Gay Activist Alliance in the 70s and continuing through his work in the 80s to demand a response to the then exploding and mostly ignored HIV AIDS crisis. Zachary Kinto, an actor who felt a responsibility to come out of the closet in response to a wave of LGBT youth suicides, and who has, who has since used his public profile as a bully pulpit to promote LGBT equality, providing kids with a living example that it gets better. And all this, working in an industry in which many say that taking such a stand will make you typecast. And Alex Stedman, a young leader in the Trevor Project who has dedicated himself to ensuring that other young people never have to experience the isolation that he once did growing up gay in a small town in Montana. Without Stonewall, the paths of these three advocates and so many others in the movement would likely have been very different. And without the relentless pressure exerted by this movement over the 45 years since then, we would surely be in a different place as a nation today. Without this movement, it is all but impossible to imagine a pride event like the one that took place last week. It was held, of all places, in the Benjamin Franklin Room at the United States State Department. And it was organized by Gays and Lesbians in Foreign Affairs Agencies, a group made up of LGBT persons, their families, and straight allies in the State Department and other federal agencies. Secretary Kerry spoke passionately at the event about aligning our practices inside the government with the principles of LGBT equality that we are projecting outside of it, such as ensuring that the partners of foreign service officers can get visas to foreign countries. Perhaps even more inspiring than the Secretary's speech 
and really, you should go read this speech, and it's one of the reasons that he's a tremendous uh, colleague and leader. Uh, but even uh, more inspiring than that was the person who introduced him, Robin McCutcheon. Robin is the first transgender foreign service officer to come out on the job. She's not only been a leading advocate for LGBT rights within the department, but she also authored State's first report on transgender issues. How about that for living our values? Well, you can draw a line from that pride event at the State Department right back to the pride shown by those brave individuals at Stonewall. But before we get too carried away with all this progress talk, we of course have to acknowledge the obvious, that the struggle sparked at Stonewall is far from over. While a growing number of states have recognized same-sex marriages, several others are considering legislation that would allow businesses to refuse service to LGBT people, justifying it as promoting religious freedom. And while this year the National Football League drafted its first openly gay player, there is still no federal law that prevents Michael Sam from being fired for being gay. And when that player celebrated his achievement by kissing his partner on camera, several NFL players responded with homophobic tweets. One would hope that if a sports figure were caught on tape disparaging people for who they love, as Donald Sterling was caught disparaging people for the color of their skin, that it would draw universal condemnation and revulsion. But right now, I think it's fair to say we couldn't count on that. Now, as real as the challenges are that we face here at home, and that my colleagues will speak to, uh, they are even greater in other countries. In fact, there are some parts of the world where the situation abroad is actually taking a sharp turn for the worse for LGBT individuals, becoming more intolerant and more dangerous. Back in February, uh, I met with an LGBT activist from Uganda named Frank Mugisha. At the time, the president of his country was contemplating signing the Anti-Homosexuality Act, which proposed setting a life sentence for consensual same-sex acts and broadly criminalized what was called the promotion of homosexuality. Even before the law, LGBT people in Uganda were suffering widespread abuse, and Frank told me that he feared that its passage would make the situation even worse. He was right. Less than two weeks after I met with Frank, Uganda's president signed the legislation into law. Since then, arbitrary arrests, beatings, harassment, and other abuses by police have increased. LGBT people have been evicted from their homes by landlords fearful of being charged with promoting homosexuality, for leasing apartments to a gay person. And health providers have cut back on services to LGBT people, fearing that they too will be criminally liable as complicit. Unfortunately, Uganda's anti-gay legislation is not an outlier, nor is the climate of intolerance and abuse that it has fostered. Indeed, it's a pattern we've seen following the passage of similarly homophobic legislation in countries worldwide, such as Russia and Nigeria. Nearly 80 countries now have laws that criminalize LGBT individuals. In seven of them, and it'll be eight if Brunei continues along its path, consensual same-sex acts are punishable by death. So what can we in the U.S. government do about this alarming trend? Well, just as we are practicing what we preach on LGBT equality inside the government, we have to be ready to bring our principles to bear in our foreign policy. To that end, President Obama warned the Ugandan president that there would be consequences for our relationship with his country if he signed anti-gay legislation, and he has followed through on that commitment. Last week, we announced measures to deny entry to the U.S. by certain Ugandan officials involved in serious human rights abuses, including abuses against LGBT individuals. We have canceled plans for a joint military exercise. While we continue to press Ugandan police to respect the rights of all people, we will stop supporting a community policing program. And even as we remain steadfastly committed to working toward addressing the real health needs of the Ugandan people, we are redirecting certain health funds to non-governmental partners so as to ensure that no one intended to receive that support is turned away on the grounds of their sexual orientation. Of course, our actions alone will not be able to reverse this appalling trend, but I am proud to serve under a president who is committed to sending a message that such legislation and similar acts of intolerance will affect our relationships with other countries. So as we look back over the 45 years since Stonewall, we can see how far we've come, thanks in large part due to the work of brave individuals like Robin McCutcheon and the three advocates you will hear from today. 
but we can also see how much further we have left to go. Yes, we have amazing projects like It Gets Better, which didn't exist when Bill and Zachary were growing up. But we still need projects like it, and the phones at the Trevor Project keep ringing day and night because in some parts of our country, in some communities, and in some families, it still can be very, very bad. Because some LGBT kids need to hear that it won't always hurt as much as it does right now. And they need to hear that before the pain becomes overwhelming for them, so long as those kids are out there, so long as those phones are still ringing, we still have work, real work to do. And I go one step further, and full disclosure, it's a big step, Martin Luther King once said famously, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. If we believe that that is the case, and I think we do, and if we are truly universal champions of LGBT uh, equality, as I know we are, and if we are witnessing such an alarming backlash against LGBT rights in so many parts of the world as we unquestionably are, then it is our duty to take the lessons that we have learned in our own movement and share them with the people who are waging this struggle beyond our borders. They too need to know that it gets better. They need any help that we can offer in making it better. And who better to help them answer that call as we look back upon the 45 years since Stonewall than us. So thank you and with that, I have the privilege of now turning the floor over to my, to my colleagues. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, it is quite a privilege to have been invited to speak here today. Uh, and thank you very much for your opening uh, talk. Uh, it's incredibly comprehensive about the issues that uh, we face today and a little bit ab about how we got here. Um, it's amazing how far we've come in the last 45 years since Stonewall. It's also astounding how much is still left to be done to achieve full equality for LGBT people in the United States and worldwide. I was not at the Stonewall Bar the night of June 28, 1969, but I was and I am a part of the Stonewall generation. I'm old enough to remember being a part of many movements the black and Latin civil rights movements, the women's and lesbian civil rights movements, the struggles for transgender rights and equality. I was a part of the hippie generation, progressive music movements from American jazz, early blues, to rock, punk, industrial, and new wave, from Ella Fitzgerald to the Beatles, the Stones, and to the Pet Shop Boys. I owned every piece of vinyl on ECM records and worshiped the grooves within. ECM was a progressive jazz label uh, in the 70s. It uh, was very much a part of me. I was, a, I was a little young to be a part of the beat generation, but I'm sure this movement helped shape me too. I mentioned all these movements because we need to educate ourselves about human rights struggles. They teach us about human dignity and how we can advance as a people. I have been a journalist, a columnist, an activist, a club DJ, videographer, and a photographer. But who was I, who were we in 1969? If you were gay, what might your life be like? For many, or should I say most, it was a life of hiding in the shadows. I don't say that figuratively. People actually hid in the shadows. There was little light in those closets. The glare of a street light might be enough to get you outed, to lose your job, to lose your family. People met on the piers behind trucks in the meatpacking district. They were dark and silent. 
Even the bars were dark. But in the summer of 1969, there was an atmosphere of change. Stonewall changed everything. There was a spirit that the streets belonged to us. The bravest among us were afraid no more. Chants of whose streets were answered back by our streets. There was an attempt to organize the gay community with a group called the Gay Liberation Front. But it wasn't until the formation of the Gay Activist Alliance in 1970 that there was a movement that began to really shake things up. GAA stopped the harassment of gay bars. GAA changed the media. GAA changed attitudes of what it meant to be gay, lesbian, and transgender. We established a community center in an old abandoned firehouse on Worcester Street in Soho. We met every Thursday night at the firehouse, at that firehouse, for our general meetings. We met every other night of the week for community committee meetings. There were photo collages on the walls of the firehouse, and they all included pictures of the Black Panthers and the Young Lords, our contemporaries. Black, white, gay, straight, same struggle, same fight. The firehouse was our home. For some youths thrown out of their family homes, it could be a temporary shelter. In addition to all the meetings, we had Saturday night dances. We charged only $2 at the door, which included free beer and soda. Those dances managed to pay for all the expenses of running a four-story firehouse. Those dances also paid for all the expenses of demonstrations and legal dis uh, expenses of GAA. We had speakers committees that spoke about the gay liberation movement. We spoke to between two to 4,000 high school and college students every week for four years that GAA had its most active period. We marched from Times Square to Albany. We had demonstrations two or three times a week, sometimes two demos in one day. We had a TV show showing our demonstrations. We had a weekly cabaret and Saturday night films hosted by Vito Russo. There was Arthur Evans, Nath Rockhill, Ginny Vida, Jim Owls, Marty Robinson, Morty Manford, Pete Fisher, Mark Rubin, Rich Wandel. Everyone was known by their full names. No one was anonymous anymore. It used to be that, uh, you know, in the gay community, you knew, you know, uh, well, I was Bill, so I was Billy. You know, when, when I joined GAA and I had uh, 75 to 150 people who were active in the organization during its heyday, I was Bill Ballman. And it wasn't always like, you know, how you doing, Bill? It was like, hey, you know, how you doing, Bill Ballman? How you doing, Rich Wanthel? It was, we were friends, and we made a point of being non-anonymous and using our full names. There were a couple of people in GAA who actually used uh, – stage names, so to speak, at first, but even they uh, reverted to their real names o over a short period of time. One of the, uh, we did an awful lot in that period that helped propel the movement that we still experience today and that many of us in the room are a part of. Uh, and it was that propulsion of the work that was done in those initial three or four years that helped strengthen uh, and make it possible for large mainstream organizations to do the work and advocate for their, our community. One of the things that we did in GAA was we zap, and a zap is a, uh, a personal confrontation of someone who oppresses you, uh, where you're not just demonstrating outside of a building. You go inside and you take up, you, you know, you make yourself at home wherever you are. And one of, one, of the, one of the demonstrations that we did was at the American Psychiatric Association's annual meeting, which was held at the New York Hilton in New York City. I organized 10 members of GAA to show up and get ourselves into the room where they were discussing homosexuality. Uh, 
And at an agreed upon time, everything's always timed like clockwork, you know, in terms of an action like that. Uh, first person got up and said, how dare you refer to us as, uh, refer to homosexuality as a disorder. Each member popped up with different uh, issues being raised against the American Psychiatric Association for their, uh, their treatment of gay people. Uh, you know, they were, people had been lobotomized. Uh, people had been told they were disordered. Uh, people uh, given electroshock therapy. And we, we were like drawing a line in the sand that this, was, this all had to stop. And we had to speak for ourselves and we were, uh, you know, right there in front of them demanding that you see us here and you address us. And it, it, they were very surprised by our action. They were also seemed genuinely surprised that there were gay people in a room uh, demanding that they not be called disordered, you know, as if they were coming across a happy homosexual for the first time in their lives. And this, <laughs> and, and this was something uh, that was new to them. Uh, but this confrontation led within one year uh, the next meeting in Hawaii where Ron Gold, a member of GAA, managed to get the American Psychiat Psychiatric Association to change their classification for homosexuality as no longer being a disorder. This is one of many, many things that uh, the movement did in the early days and uh, as we see now, there's a momentum now for, for gay marriage where a decision by uh, district judges and now appeals court judges uh, saying that there is no uh, justification for discrimination against gay people. And this is important. And I think all of these rulings, if you've had a chance to read any of them, and I urge you to do so, um, some of them are lengthy, some are uh, not as lengthy as others, but I think they're worth reading because they are a testament to who we are as a people and what discrimination is about and how it should not, should not be tolerated. I uh, just want to say just a very couple of quick things uh, that the uh, ENDA, uh, which is in Congress, that would uh, grant, uh, make it illegal to discriminate in, against gay people is not equal. There are too many uh, loopholes in the law and it needs to be scrapped and be uh, reintroduced next year in Congress. The, the, the laws uh, that have been passed in a number of African countries and in Russia, they need to be fought. They need to be fought because people are dying because of uh, this discrimination and these laws and the justification. People were dying before, but it's escalated the violence and discrimination. It also plays a very important role in, in HIV care because if people are being discriminated against and they're under threat of violence, they cannot go to clinics to get their medicine to stay alive. Uganda had a very good program where they were uh, reducing numbers of new infections some 10, 15 years ago. They were uh, one of the sort of gold standards of a developing country that was doing a lot to reduce uh, risk of transmission. All of that has been thrown asunder. And we need to bring the world community together and fight this kind of discrimination and make it clear that, you know, what may seem like a good short-term political goal for a politician is not a long-term uh, strategy uh, toward progress of humanity on a worldwide level. So we need to reach out we need to stay involved and work together. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Zachary Quinto. Um, um, it's a great honor to be here, so thank you to the ambassador for inviting me. Um, I, I'm so inspired, first of all, by all the work that you just spoke of doing and 
I'm of a different generation, uh, and I, I, I hesitate to generalize, but I, I think it's safe to say I'm of a lazier generation. Um, and, and the sad news is it doesn't seem to be getting any less lazy um, as the generations mount up uh, and as we go on. And I think that there are a number of reasons for that, and primary among them is the, the, the fight that came before and the fight that needed to be fought and ultimately the shoulders that we and those that come after us are standing on uh, with regard to this issue in particular. Um, the first time I went into the Stonewall Bar was actually last year. Um, and, and the only reason <laughs> that it merits uh, mentioning is that I was just sort of wandering through the neighborhood and it was, uh, it was Pride Weekend. And, uh, and I happened to get caught in this melee and, uh, and realized that I, I, I was just, and I was just back in town for, for one day and sort of walking around my neighborhood and find myself here and, and find myself at the stage on which Edith Windsor uh, was speaking after uh, the Supreme Court made their ruling. Um, and it was one of the most inspiring uh, New York moments that I could have ever hoped to be a part of um, because it wasn't planned. And to, to stand there and to feel the energy in the same spot uh, in which this ultimate declaration was made uh, was something that was so exciting that I'll never forget and that will always remain with me. Um, and, and just to talk a little bit about um, where we are now, what, what, you know, how, how do we carry forward? How do we move on? How do we expand, um, not only in this country but around the world, uh, a sense of acceptance? And, and for me, and it's maybe difficult to contextualize this, but it, it can't be political. It can't, um, it can't rest necessarily upon legislation or laws or, or rules. It has to be something more than that. Those things are essential. Those things are a kind of glue uh, that keep us accountable to one another, that keep us responsible uh, and, and beholden to ourselves. But we have to look deeper than that and we have to look at the human experience and we have to look at what's really a question here and we have to invite people and especially young people we have to invite them into this discourse because things are changing so rapidly. I mean, if you look at the legal landscape of this country in the last eight years, it is unrecognizable in terms of the legislature toward equality. It is a fait accompli. There are 19 states and the District of Columbia. It is a staggering number when you consider that there were virtually none, uh, you know, just a few years ago. Um, it's inspiring. It is. Uh, it should it should be igniting us um, because we are on completely different ground as a country, as a society, uh, and as a culture uh, than we ever have been before. But now all this stuff is happening internationally. So how do we look to ourselves, as the ambassador said? How do we uh, be the ones to stand up and to 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 beat the drum uh, of of something that really transcends borders, and that is self-respect translated into respect for others. Um, and it's a really fundamental thing. So for me, it's about how can we engage and what are we up against uh, as we engage. And I think it bears mentioning that technology, I think, is at once uh, one of our biggest challenges and yet also one of our potentially most effective tools. Case in point. Um, <laughs> how, how do we... <laughs> How do we use technology and how do we intervene on the negative impact that it can have on our society? Cyberbullying is something that I know the Trevor Project deals with uh, in, in, in mass amounts because it is the way um, that we can get to each other immediately and anonymously if, if we want to. So technology, right? So, so we're all looking at our devices all the time. And, 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 and it's for an adult, right, of my generation. When I grew up, I mean, if you weren't home, then you couldn't talk to someone on the phone. You just couldn't do it. A message was left or, you know, what, what, an answering machine had a cassette tape in it. I mean, this is, this is from then till now where, like, you know, anywhere you go, I have the great gift. I feel like being of this generation for me is such a great gift because I know what it was like before, right? And yet I'm still on Instagram any chance I get sort of on the subway just, like, checking what's going on. Like, I'm still drawn into these inevitable advancements that none of us can do anything to unwind. So how do we now harness that energy and use it uh, to our benefit, right? Um, and, and then you think about these younger generations who on one hand are so much more comfortable in their sexual identities than I ever was. You know, I came out at 24 and coming out for me was a lot more complicated and that's a, a longer and probably less interesting story in terms of my relationship to 
my career as an actor. And, you know, I made very specific, very personal decisions, and I did it for very personal reasons, and there's a number of articles that you can read if you're interested in knowing what they are. <laughs> but, um, but, but, but another, but the primary reason was for those kids who were killing themselves because they were being bullied. They were being relentlessly tortured and tormented for who they authentically were. So on one hand, you have kids at a much younger age, right, standing up to say, well, this is who I am. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to acknowledge this reality of my life. And then just sort of you, you, you take this technology, which is, you know, I'm going to tweet at you. I'm going to put things on your Facebook page that make you feel horrible. I'm going to secretly record you in your college dorm room while you're having, you know, one of the first of your most intimate encounters of your life, discovering who you are, right? All very, very toxic, negative, damaging uses of technology. But there are also then, you know, organizations like the Trevor Project that can use technology. And I trained at the Trevor Project on the lifelines. I, I worked on the phones at that organization because I wanted to understand what happens and how it works. And I will tell you something, it is one of the most remarkable organizations in this country right now doing work for kids who are, whose lives I can personally attest to being not only changed but saved because there is always someone to pick up that phone. So to the Trevor Project and, and the contribution that they make to this movement on a very fundamental and human way, I say, you know, I am so enormously grateful for your existence and that I got to cross paths and work with you. But, you know, so, so technology, I'm rambling, but technology, we have to figure out how we can use it to our advantage and we have to invite young kids into being responsible to who they are and being responsible to uh, being guideposts for the younger generation to just say, look, there's a way to be happy, there's a way to be integrated, there is a way to take all of this pain, all this adversity that has been hard won and fought through by the people like Bill and the people that were at Stonewall, the people that created ACT UP, the people that, you know, have really blazed the trail through all of, of, of the obstacles that we faced along the way. Um, and, and be responsible and, and learn uh, how to be a responsible citizen and learn how to be a responsible person. Uh, I hope that I can contribute to that in some way. I think being here today and being a part of this dialogue which was so beautifully structured on this continuum, people that have been fighting, people that have been more recently joining the fight, and people who are defining the fight as we go from this point um, is, is a huge step in that direction. So I'm thrilled for the honor. Um, I feel like I didn't really write anything or prepare anything because there's so much to say and every time I come to a discourse like this, I'm inspired, I learn, I, I know that there's something else I need to read, there's somebody else that I need to know that their work was a part of this puzzle that we're all trying to put together uh, and it does go beyond this country and, and that's a whole other level of how do we then uh, use that power and invite these people to show in fact the world um, that it's not just an issue of politics, it is an issue of humanity and we are all that, and we always will be. Uh, and above all, that's what I think we have a responsibility to. And thank you. Hey, y'all. Um, my name's Alex. I am the youth representative from the Trevor Project. I am so honored to be here today with all of you um, inspiring individuals. Um, again, let's give a big hand of a welcome to our amazing guest panelists. Thank you so much. Um, each of your stories, um, no matter how far distant in the past or current they may be, have personally resonated with me in my journey today. And so it just goes to show that these struggles that we're having past, present, are also our future. Um, so I really appreciate the work you've done in the past and will continue to do, so thank you so much. Um, a little bit of background about, about me. Um, again, my name's Alex, um, I'm from the Trevor Project. I worked with the Youth Advisory Council. So Trevor Project has this great um, initiative called Youth Advisory Council where they um, gather individuals, youth advocates from around the country who are passionate about Trevor's Project's works, work and advocate for them in their own communities. I started that in high school. Um, I'm currently a rising junior at New York University studying social work, but I started working with Trevor in high school um, in Hamilton, Montana. Hey, Hamilton, if you're out there. <laughs> um, and so I was inspired by individuals who believed in me, who um, I work, we're working in New York, in LA, for the good fight, and, and now I'm here with, with you guys. So it's kind of surreal and full circle for me, so thank you. Um, some other stuff that I'm doing, uh, I actually just got back from Ghana. 
Um, I studied abroad there for a semester uh, last spring, so it's all very new to me. So again, the conversations we're having about the African struggle are very real, and I hope to continue conversations about them with Ambassador Powers at some point, if possible. Um, so it's, again, it's my, <laughs> maybe, maybe not, I don't know, <laughs> we'll see. Um, but uh, it's my job to, today to kind of wrap things up and go full circle um, with this amazing event that we put on today. Uh, I was tasked with uh, getting a list of questions um, from youth around the country who I know and respect very much because I am just one youth, I am one single story, so I cannot represent all of the youth of this nation who are coming out and struggling. Um, but I can attest to some of their stories and some of the questions that they have for our amazing panelists today. So if you're up for it, I have some questions for you. Game? Yep. Sweet. <laughs> cool. Um, I guess we will start with Bill. Um, Bill and I had a great honor of talking backstage before this whole thing started, so I want to say thank you for all the work that you've ever done, because I'm here because of you, and I want to honor you for that. But uh, going to the question, <laughs> um, kind of linking our two journeys together, what is one trait or quality that today's LGBTQ youth activists can take away from your generation's fight for equality? That's a difficult question, but actually the answer is fairly easy. Uh, to believe in yourself. Uh, the, I, I spoke about GAA some uh, 44 years ago uh, when it was formed. There were members of GAA who were as young as 13 years of age, and they spoke in high schools and colleges at those speaking engagements that I referred to. Uh, it's never too early to get involved and to stay involved. I initially uh, got involved as a community activist in, the, in GAA, and I made a conscious decision that I would do one year of community service and then go about my life for, for the, continue to be a private citizen, so to speak. But I continued on uh, with AIDS activism and helping found ACT UP and the Lavender Hill Mob, which was one of the first uh, AIDS activist groups met in my apartment in the West Village. Uh, there, you don't have to be a part of a major organization. You don't, it's, I encourage people to join the Trevor Project because they do great work, but it, you can form your own organizations and you can do a lot uh, with just you and your friends and some people that you uh, uh, meet through Facebook and uh, so other social media. There, there is so much that you can do, but the most, key important thing is to believe in yourself, whatever that is, and when you see discrimination, speak up about it. Thank you, Bill. Um, moving on to our next question. Uh, I guess this one will go out to uh, Zach. Just mix up a bit. Um, the fight for marriage equality has consistently dominated the conversation around LGBT rights. Should the freedom to marry continue to be the number one focus of the LGBT movement when there are so many other issues needing to be championed? Yeah, these aren't uh, your walk in the park kind of questions, are they? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, look, you know, I think that any fight for a group of people needs to have, um, needs to have a unifying uh, force. And I think equality and marriage equality and, uh, and, and the fact that it was a very tangible uh, and real uh, legal issue was something that, uh, that people could really get behind. It was something that I think was, I mean, it, it absolutely was the, the, the turning of the tide and the thing that, that mounted. I remember in 2008 in California where I was living at the time, the marches uh, around, around Prop 8 and, uh, and, and, and the, the feeling of the building momentum and the feeling that, that this was going to be um, something that changed the game. And I think we're now in this place where it's, you know, every day I look at the news, it's, it feels like there's another state that's striking down a, a ban against same-sex marriage. And it's, it's inspiring and it's exciting. And I think we need to allow ourselves a period of adjustment, a period of, um, of reevaluation to say, what is next? You know, I think HIV and, and AIDS awareness in this country domestically among young people is something that we also really need to turn our attention to. And uh, the aspect of being lazy doesn't just go with not doing things. It, it goes with not caring for yourself or not feeling like you need to because 
you know, a whole generation of men were decimated, but you weren't around to see it. Uh, I was a child of the 80s, um, but a child, so um, I saw it peripherally, and I, and I, you know, heard stories, and that's something that I think we cannot underestimate. I think people have gotten way, young people have gotten way too comfortable um, and flagrant about sexual encounters in this country, and, and of course that reflects what happens in other parts of the world um, where science isn't even fully implemented into understandings of sex. So all the time, you know, in third world countries. So I, I feel like, you know, there, there are definitely other issues, but I think we need to give ourselves one moment of breath to say, not bad, <laughs> you know, at all, for mm -hmm. a short amount of time to have so much momentum and unstoppable movement forward take place is, is impressive and, and it should serve to, to continue our unity and continue us to, to move into those other and very necessary issues. You're not wrong. Cool. Thank you. Um, Ambassador Powers, I won't grill you on Africa quite right now, but um, a more simple question, maybe a simple question. <laughs> um, we'll see. Um, in keeping with this afternoon's theme of how far we have to come, how far we have to go, what do you see as the next frontier for the LGBT movement? And with that, um, what barriers or challenges do we still need to overcome to achieve this? Um, <coughs> it's so general that it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was easy for you. I'm sorry. Uh, I, can no, go, no. I can go Africa if you want. No, no, <laughs> no. Uh, I mean, I'm you know where you sit uh, helps dictate your focus and. Uh, what I read every morning are reports about the ways in which uh, this flurry of new laws uh, are, um, you know, both being in, enforced, but also even off of the enforcement issue um, being abused. So being enforced is bad enough. <laughs> but then, uh, unfortunately, what it does is licenses also uh, not just state enforcement, but vigilante action of a kind that is, um, I mean, for lack of a better word, just horrifying. And um, our embassies around the world um, each uh, have reported now for, I guess, more than 30 years on human rights in the world. That was a big deal. It was actually something that the Congress foisted upon the executive branch in the first instance, because uh, it's no secret that you know, particularly early on, taking on human rights issues generally was not something uh, a lot of uh, administrations wanted to do. Now it's built into the DNA. We have an assistant secretary for human rights. Our embassies report on human rights conditions, whether labor conditions or the conditions of civil society, Al Jazeera journalists who've been locked up by the Egyptian government. I mean, these are things that we report on. And what's really important, I think, that people understand is that uh, reporting on abuses against LGBT persons are uh, incredibly prominent in what our embassies are looking for. So uh, by the same token, you know, improvements and leadership and civil society groups, even not necessarily LGBT groups, but groups that take up this cause and um, pose legal challenges, you know, that's some of the things that have been happening in Uganda. You see, uh, you know, not LGBT groups, but other uh, legal defense uh, entities taking up the cause and, and, and fighting this fight. But you can't read what we read uh, every day, and again, it's I, the best job in the world, get to be the ambassador to the United Nations, but also just sitting in the government, just the prism we get into what's going on across the board. You see the export, not of best practices, which was the way it was all supposed to work, <laughs> but of worst practices. You see people studying Putin's anti-homosexuality law and then like literally cribbing and translating provisions and putting it in their laws. So um, that, at least internationally, um, is something that we really have got to um, sh show enhanced leadership on. I think as, again, the U.S. government is showing leadership, but we can't, we can't do it alone. Like the networks that have been tapped and fortified over the years in this country, these are networks that can be really, really helpful. And they, they, you see it in the activists that you meet around the world who are really, I mean, at grave physical risk in some cases, uh, in many cases, and just the solidarity they feel, uh, I mean, even just that. If you, all you do on a given day, it's like the Trevor Project. If all you're there is to answer the phone, that's a major piece of business. Uh, never mind funding for legal defense or, um, you know, helping uh, them understand how to use uh, technologies in order to um, 
create broader coalitions than just LGBT coalitions. Because I think it's what can the LGBT community globally do for folks who are in that situation is one issue. The other is how does it get mainstreamed in the way that it happened here, you know, thanks of course, in the first instance, uh, to the to the brave work of, of uh, people in the movement itself. So so that 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 is what, what I focus on. I will say on the marriage equality uh, question that you posed earlier, if I may, just as an American, I think uh, I say this is you know this is your all of your what you're living with day in day out. But um, I, I think the marriage equality, in addition to being one metric, an insufficient metric, but one important metric of progress and of, you know, some of the barriers at least being broken down. Um, I also think it's a, it's a valence on the LGBT movement and the aspirations of uh, gay, lesbian, and transgender people. It's a, it's a face to that uh, that was more shrouded in the early years. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is, um, for people, for people who were homophobic or who brought discrimination to consideration of gay rights and inclusion and, and uh, uh, there was a way in which people are parodied and, and um, caricatured as the other in some way. But the, 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 the fact that the aspiration here is to marry and to have children. And uh, I, I think it has, um, you mentioned the darkness, I think it was a, Incredibly powerful to remember that. It's so hard for us who weren't there to 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 know that and to remember that. But uh, what marriage equality has done is it has, um, I think, uh, really given lie to some of the prejudices that were at the heart of homophobia to begin with. You know, uh, as if and it has it has shown that it's about love. Uh, you know, and it's about rights and it's about freedom and. So I think, uh, in addition to the benefits and the and the the need for equality in its own right, this aspect of it, the kind of collateral effects of the marriage equality movement, I I think over time are going to be profound. Are they, and again, maybe this is hope uh, uh, as well as uh, fact at this point. Um, but but I it, it's I think had a had a profound effect in in not just in on the coasts uh, and on the frontiers, but, but even in the heartland of this country. Uh, excuse me, um, Ambassador, um, may I ask, um, where do we stand on uh, uniting American families uh, when one has a partner who is from another country and wants it. To, it. to live in the United States? It, it, uh, issue of profound importance and uh, working it. Need to get it, need to get it done, uh, but not there yet. Great. Well, I think we're wrapping things up here. Uh, again, thank you so much for each of your insights. I really appreciate that. Um, there's so much more to talk about. We should do part two sometime. Come over to my place. We'll have a, we'll figure it out. <laughs> um, but again, thank you to all of our presenters today. And this is something that we all can personally invest in um, on a personal level. So I hope that each of you feel like you could be hopefully be activists and do your part in this grander scheme of things, this larger journey. So thank you again for being here today. Um, big hand of applause to everybody. Thank you. Great. Thank you all. You did not. Thank you.